Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and this episode, I'm joined by Jonathan Ireland. John, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? So today we're talking about the nonprofit industrial complex, and this is probably not something that people think about very much when they think about the government. They, they typically think about these government institutions like the military or the Department of Education or Congress passing bills or you know, the people who actually work in a government office. It, it's not something that is our typical image of how government works, but it is something that, especially at the state and local level, takes up a lot of what government actually is. So how would you explain it, it, I guess, in simple terms, what is the nonprofit complex that we're talking about here? Well, basically what happens is you have a lot of, uh, a lot of governments, um, rather than doing what they are, you know, generally assumed to be doing in house, they outsource a lot of their processes and a lot of the, uh, responsibility for actually running programs. A lot of that gets outsourced to third parties. Uh, private organizations, basically, um, that a lot of the time are uh, 501c3s, like um, tax exempt nonprofits, things like that. Uh, specifically, that happens a lot with homelessness programs, where a lot of the time when you think of like government homelessness programs, people might think that the government is the one actually doing, uh, actually running these various programs. But usually, what happens uh, a lot more often is that they have nonprofit organizations who they basically pay to run all of the homelessness programs. And this is also true with how they do affordable housing. You know, we don't really build very much actual public housing in this country anymore. What you mostly do is you have affordable housing nonprofits, which you then subsidize. So you say um, you're allowed to, you know, in order to be an affordable housing nonprofit and get subsidies, you have to only charge, say, 30% of someone's uh, income in rent, and then we'll subsidize you to make up the difference, or we'll pay you some sort of subsidy so that you um, are able to charge that uh, without going broke, rather than just having some sort of public housing situation. So basically, what we've done is we've privatized most um, government programs regarding homelessness, affordable housing, uh, a whole host of other things. We've privatized a lot of these programs. But nobody refers to it as privatization because they aren't for-profit corporations. And so because they're, you know, nonprofits, people think of them as being like charities. When in reality, a lot of them are, are not really run like charitable organizations. They're run in a way that benefits the people who are in control of them. The president or CEO of the nonprofit oftentimes is uh, getting paid quite handsomely, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, um... Basically, it's this form of privatization where you use 501c3s as opposed to for-profit corporations. So if that makes sense. Let's uh, let, let's take a one second and, and give kind of the positive case here, because I think we're going to spend right. a pretty good amount of time here uh, talking about why this arrangement is terrible. So right. to be, you know, to try to give the strongest case possible for why this happens in the first place, like what is the rationale? Why why does this exist in the first place? How in theory, why is this a, a good thing to do? Well, what's funny is, you know, a lot of the logic that they would generally use to justify it sounds very similar to the logic that, you know, a libertarian would use when, uh, when privatizing the government with actual for-profit corporations, because um, they'll, they'll make the argument that it's cheaper, for example, because, uh, you know, you don't need to use what well, really because I mean, you don't need to use unionized um, government employees. Uh, you um, a lot of the time, these organizations have um, a lot of uh, volunteers and stuff like that. Uh, so the argument a lot of the time that you'll hear the kind of positive case would be that it's actually a cheaper way to provide these services because um, ostensibly labor costs are lower you don't have all of this government bureaucracy. Um, in practice, I don't think it actually works out that way. But that is um, oftentimes kind of what the, what the theory behind it is and the justification. But a lot of the time, I also think that there's no real 
justification because it's almost something that just happened and nobody really a lot a lot of time nobody did it intentionally and nobody was like oh this is better than having it run through the government it just kind of happened naturally as a result of a bunch of other processes that were going on and so a lot of the time i don't even think that it's necessarily something where people had a justification or a reason to do it it just naturally transpired because we had gutted the ability for the government to do a lot of these things already. We'd already, you know, killed state capacity. And then, but people still wanted there to be homelessness programs. So a lot of the time, I don't even think that it's, it's really true that there was a, an inactive thought process of people wanting to put this in place. So much as it just happened because we'd already destroyed the ability for the government to do anything. And so then we just, nonprofits were just there. As we use and them, we instead. made one or two, one or two different choices, uh, you know, decades right. ago, and now just past dependency uh, has led us right. on this path. It, it's a very odd position for me to be in, uh, you know, it, as the, you know, uh, the self-described neoliberal sometimes to to kind of be looking at this and saying, "Wow, you know, privatizing the government that seemed to that seems to have worked out terribly. Oh, we should not do that anymore." <laughs> It, it, it's almost a little backwards. The thing about privatization is that I think there are two kinds of privatization, right? There's privatization where something actually operates in the private market, where like if you if you have a government, uh, a good example of this would be like Aer Lingus in uh, in Ireland. They had, they used to be a government owned airline company, and they privatized the airline company. Well, when you privatize an airline company, all you do if you just sell the airline company to private investors and now it's just a normal private airline company, it operates fine. It operates like any other private company would. The problem, I think, with something like using nonprofits, um, and, and this is also the problem with, you know, private prisons. This is the problem with um, Chicago, you know, sold the rights to their, uh, to all of their uh, uh, parking meters to a company for 75 years, Right. And the problem with that kind of privatization is it's not really operating within a market because the only actual the only actual client is the government. So it's not something where it's really operating in a free market at all because the government is the one providing all of the funding for it. Or, you know, so it's basically like it's something that was a government monopoly, basically. And they turned it into a government monopsony, which is where the government, a monopsony is when there's only one buyer, right? And that's not really a free market because the government is still the one responsible for fully funding it. So all you've done is, you know, so it, it, you, it's not really privatization because it's not a private system at all. The government is still funding the entire thing. It's just that you have private organizations running everything instead of the government which just introduces another layer of bureaucracy and makes it so that the system is a lot less efficient. So we've got this kind of setup and, and this is, you know, if you're a progressive, you're in a weird place because the, per, the most progressive cities in the country do this a lot. But, you know, right. if you're a neoliberal, you're in a weird place because, you know, it, technically it, it seems like privatization, even though it's like you said, it's not really. But... I guess what I want to know as we kind of dig into this, what is the current status of this arrangement? Where does it seem to be practiced the most? Uh, to w what, what kind of scale are we talking about here when we talk about, like, say, a, a particular city's budget? How much of that budget might actually be spent by the government entity itself and on government employees and directly controlled programs, as opposed to how much might be spent on... Um, uh, you know, by nonprofits doing nonprofit stuff, the government outsourcing something. How big is this, and and how well is it working? W what is the current state of things? Well, I mean, in in uh in San Francisco, it's something like uh something like six billion dollars goes to private private contracts. I'm not sure the exact uh the exact money out of like you know fourteen billion dollar budget. Um, I mean, on the West Coast in particular, a you know, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars in a lot of these cities are going into nonprofit organizations and other kind of private entities to run all these programs, um, especially affordable housing programs. Uh, homelessness is a big one. 
And so it, it's a big thing on the West Coast, um, not only because I think ideologically they're predisposed to fund a lot of these kind of left-leaning nonprofit organizations because that's kind of the most, you know, left, left-wing part of the country, the most progressive part of the country, you know, Portland, Seattle, California, places like that. Um, but in addition to uh, just ideologically them being predisposed to do that, I think a big push factor in spending a lot of money on these nonprofit organizations is homelessness. And so the parts of the country that have the most homelessness tend to spend huge amounts of money on this because you have the, all of these homelessness or nonprofits, you know, people running uh, homeless shelters sometimes or you know, stuff. There, there are like homeless camps. There are homeless tent encampments that are just run by nonprofits, so that you at least have some security there instead of just having you know complete anarchy in the encampment. I mean, there are homelessness encampments that are actually run by nonprofits. Uh, so I and and also a big one is the affordable housing. A lot of those are nonprofits. So I think that a uh, big reason you see so much. Um, nonprofit activity and so much spending on nonprofits, you know, to the tune of billions of dollars in some, some of these cities, you know, like it can be, you know, 30, 40 percent of the city's budget. Uh, the reason you see so much on the West Coast, I think, is not only because they're ideologically predisposed to support a lot of these organizations, but also because there's so much homelessness and housing is so unaffordable that they then just have tons of spending on homelessness and affordable housing nonprofits out there. Uh, so I say that that's the worst in terms of outsourcing government programs to nonprofit organizations. Uh, but it, I mean, it, it happens everywhere to some extent because you also see it a lot with um, with kind of anti-crime initiatives where instead of using the police, they'll have uh, violence interrupters that are usually just, you know, nonprofit organizations that a lot of the time don't really have very much oversight at all. It seems to me to kind of intersect with a, a common complaint I have against progressive ways of governing, which is that yeah, it, it, rather than solve a problem, rather than really be focused on outcomes, there's a lot of instances where kind of very left-leaning organizations will take basically an, an attitude that the money is the win. You know, oh well, you know, we're we're really upset by this instance of police brutality, for instance, and and maybe right. rightfully so. But the solution is that we spent a bunch of money on a program, and and is that actually going to work? Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't really have any way to know or care. But we act, we did spend a bunch of money on the program, and it, it seems to me like this is kind of intersecting with that in some ways. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, to, to some extent, but I mean, the, the other issue is another aspect of, uh, of modern kind of the way progressives deal with things that I think is a big push factor on this too, is that progressives for whatever reason, um, I, it, it, this isn't just a progressive thing. I think this is an American pathology to an extent where if something isn't working, instead of figuring out how to fix the, the program, fix the system, the attitude is just, we're just going to cut all its funding. Or we're just going to, we should just abolish it. I mean, you have, you have progressives where when they're upset about something that the cops do, instead of coming up with any kind of actual reform to fix the issue, the response is just let's slash their funding. And the same thing happened in the, I mean, the same thing's been happening since the 60s, really, where, you know, we had a bunch of scandals with all of our mental health facilities and all of our psychiatric facilities. So what do we do? We don't say let's reform our psychiatric facilities, let's reform our mental health facilities and fix the problem so that we still have these mental health facilities to put people who are, are in severe psychiatric distress who need somewhere to be put placed. Instead, we just get rid of all our hospital beds. So starting in the 60s, we get rid of all the psychiatric hospital beds, right? And so, I mean, like all of the psych beds basically just, com the, the number that we had, uh, I mean, by 1980, 80% of Massachusetts psychiatric beds had already been, been eliminated in the state of Massachusetts. And now it's down like 95% from where it was in 1960. And the reason for that is we had problems with our psych hospitals. So instead of reforming them, we just eliminated them. Well, the problem is you eliminate these, th this government program or you completely slash funding to a government program because it's not working. And you still need some way to handle people 
who have severe mental health problems. You still need some way to handle all of the people who are going to wind up homeless because now you can't put them in a psychiatric facility. But you don't have any government programs anymore. You got rid of all those. So what do you do? Well, there's already some nonprofit that exists. So you just start funding the nonprofits to take over from what the government used to do, except it's a lot less efficient. A lot of the time, their goals are at cross purposes with one another. So I think the two mm-hmm. issues are, and this is a problem in just American politics in general, but it's a big issue with contemporary progressive thought in particular, where if they don't like something, they just, you know, they just turn the table over. They just, you know, wipe the board clear and say, let's just cut all the funding to this government program because it's not working. Let's just eliminate it. Let's not bother reforming it. And so paradoxically, yeah. you know, they wind up, and, and so then you need something to replace it and you use nonprofits is basically my point. I'll extend that even to, you know, I don't even think this is particularly a progressive problem as much as it is just, as you said, the the instinct in American politics is to argue over how much money goes to stuff, I think. You know, right. if, if the police have done something bad and, and we separate ourselves into pro-police and anti-police camps, the, the conversation is all about defunding the police, and, you know, as we've all heard that right. phrase. Or conservatives just want to give more money to the police. It's always a talking point that conservatives would love to fund more military stuff, more police. And it's, just, it's never about what the police are actually getting. It's just about we need to give them a, a bigger number. And on the flip right. side, you know, it, it, with like, I don't know, welfare programs or whatever the case is, it, it always frustrates me again that it's never about how efficiently the program is run. It's always, you know, number go right. up. If you're a progressive, number go down if you're a conservative. And and that just seems to be how we how we work in American politics. And it's it's massively frustrating for anybody who cares about just, you know, I I almost don't care what the number is. I would rather my politics is like I would rather focus on whatever we're going to spend, whatever we negotiated. Let's at least make sure we spend it competently. But right. um but so to to kind of travel down that pathway, let me lead us down the transition to the next thing I want to talk about. Okay. If we're going to be doing things competently, then we need to be able to measure what's happening within these nonprofits somehow. And and you had a really good article recently that we're going to link in the show notes about how in a lot of instances, some really shady stuff is happening in the nonprofit industrial complex that, that when things get outsourced, it really does not lead to good outcomes. And and in a lot of times, people are horrified by what ends up happening in these circumstances. Right. Uh, I mean, well, a big a big issue is it. Let me just let me just put it to you this way, right? If someone wants to be hired by an actual government agency, right? There's going to be background checks on that person, and you're going to know, uh, you know, did this person has this person committed crimes? Has this person done anything that? should disqualify them from being involved in this government program. And a lot of times there are rules saying that nonprofits are supposed to do that. But the problem is if if you have this huge number of nonprofits that you're funding, right, dozens of nonprofits being funded by one city, for example, you are never, and they never do, you're never going to go in and basically have regulators check to make sure who actually is being employed by these organizations. And a lot of the time you have people who are convicted felons getting millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars from the government to do things that, uh, honestly, it's extremely dangerous to have these people involved in. And a lot of that is just because there's a complete lack of oversight of who is not only, not only who is involved with these nonprofits in terms of employees, but even who's running them. You'll have nonprofits run by convicted felons or people who have been convicted of of theft. There was one nonprofit in uh, in San Francisco recently uh, that got in trouble, and they actually like shut it down. Where this woman had taken over the nonprofit like 15 years ago, and basically they they went up stealing like millions of dollars. And she would, uh, I mean, hire you know just relatives for ridiculous positions. They were defrauding the city. This woman who was running this nonprofit that was getting millions of dollars from San Francisco every year, she was actually convicted while she pled guilty to theft because she had robbed the parking meters. She had worked for the Port of San Francisco, 
and she stole uh, thousands of dollars from the parking meters at the Port of San Francisco. And so you have someone who is a, a convicted felon, uh, pled guilty to stealing, not just stealing, stealing from the city. I mean, she was stealing from parking meters at the Port of San Francisco. And she then winds up running this nonprofit and makes millions of dollars. And, and you know, the nonprofit's making millions of dollars from the city. And the city never, I, I don't know if they never bothered background checking her at all or what the situation was, but she was just allowed to run this nonprofit that was receiving millions of dollars in funding. And of course it gets misallocated. There was a guy in Seattle who uh, was given hundreds of thousands of dollars to work with at-risk youth. And it turned out that he was a convicted sex offender from Chicago who had a fake name. He wasn't even who he was saying he was. And all of his credentials were also fake. He was just lying about having like a degree in social work from the University of Washington. And they gave him like $200,000, I think it was, to run an at-risk uh, youth program. And the guy is a convicted sex offender operating under a fake name with fake credentials. And the city never found out about this. A reporter found out about it. So this could have just gone on indefinitely because the city ne was never going to look into a lot of this stuff. I mean, there's one story in particular, and I'm, I'm sorry if there, this gets a little anecdote heavy, but these stories are all crazy. Uh, these, the, so these uh, the anecdotes are great, actually. And I really do encourage anyone who's interested in this topic. Uh, Jonathan's piece over at, uh, it was uh, American Affairs or something like that? American Affairs, yeah. Yeah, the piece is great. We're going to link it in the show notes, but it's really illustrative of some of the problems because these are things that it, I guess I won't say they could never happen in a government agency, but it's a very hard to imagine some of these kind of scenarios happening in a right. government agency. And, and it would be a much bigger scandal if they were happening in a government agency. It's well, I, think, I actually I, think, I actually oh, my apologies, but I actually think that's a big what you just said there is actually a big thing that I think needs to be discussed is the fact that this system, you know, what I just said, I mean, they're giving millions of dollars to convicted felons. They're giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to a guy who is convicted, uh, you know, a, a sex offender to work with at-risk youth, which is basically the worst thing you could have a sex offender doing, right? Um, and the thing is, this creates a, this creates a layer of... I don't, I don't know how to exactly put this. It creates distance from the politicians where not only are these people getting all of this money who should not be handling it, people who are convicted felons, people who have, who have committed theft, sometimes against the city, people who are convicted sex offenders. I mean, I know for a fact that the city of Seattle gave a $3 million no bid contract to an organization that is run by a convicted gang rapist. You look at a lot of that stuff and there is never the level of political repercussions that would take place if something like that happened and it was actually a government agency. So when the government, you know, creates this layer between itself and the people who are actually running the programs, I think it lets the politicians get away with things that they would never be able to get away with if it was a government program. You know what this reminds me of, John, is um, there's a saying, I'm going to go back to the the Russian Empire before even the USSR. We're going, this is, I promise this is going somewhere. But there's a saying um, from back then called the good Tsar and the bad boyars. And basically this is just right. like the idea that, you know, the, the, the Russian Empire was a really messed up place and a lot of terrible things happened. And people would appeal, regular people would try to appeal to the Tsar, I think. I'm going to get this slightly wrong, you know, and, and the idea was like, oh, your little, your functionaries, your dukes, your, your mid-level aristocrats are betraying you. The Tsar would never do something wrong. You know, Tsar Nicholas loves us. It's just the boyars, right. they are bad. And, and in, in a similar way, it allows you it, as, you know, a city manager or a politician the kind of number one, it's not your problem, whatever's happening. You've just outsourced it to some other thing. Whoever's taking care of the homeless problem, whoever's doing the violence interrupter program. But if something does go wrong, oh, well, it's not this progressive politician. They they love the homeless. They care for the homeless. It's those bad nonprofits. And there's that kind of, you know, middle layer to protect you in case anything goes wrong. Right. 
Well, I mean, uh, the uh, you mentioned the violence interrupters. I mean, the, the the issue with the way that a lot of these violence interrupters are hired and the fact that they really should not be involved in the stuff they're doing. Um, I just think about comparing like when some of the stuff I've heard, I've seen that some of these violence interrupters have done. And I just think what would have happened if a police officer had done that same thing? And the answer is there would have been rioting. Because, I mean, there was a situation where Chicago, and I think I mentioned this in my American Affairs piece, Chicago hired a guy to be a violence interrupter who had been released from prison like seven months earlier for attempted murder after shooting a rival gang member. He then goes, well wearing his like peacekeeper violence interrupter uniform, he then goes and takes part in the robbery of, I don't remember if it was a taxi driver or if it was an Uber driver. He takes part well in uniform with his violence interrupter uniform. He takes part in the robbery of a taxi driver or an Uber driver where they beat this guy up so badly that he lost part, he lost part of his sight. And this dude just basically got hired like within like six, seven months of getting released from prison for attempted murder after shooting a rival gang member. There was another situation in Seattle where they hired a guy to be a violence interrupter who uh, also had had gun charges in the past. He was actually, um, he, has, he assaulted a woman and the assault was, there was uh, hate crime allegations where he was allegedly yelling like racial slurs at her. Um, and so they hired this guy to be a violence interrupter again within like a year of it, within not that long of him getting released from prison. And he then proceeded to break into his girlfriend's house uh, with a knife, I think. And he threatened her, her his ex-girlfriend. He threatened her and her new boyfriend with a knife and was then shot by her younger cousin. Now, her cousin was actually an at-risk youth who was being served by the same program that this violence interrupter was hired by. So they hired a guy to be a violence interrupter. And he had a, a lengthy criminal history and he wound up being shot by one of the kids he was supposed to be keeping out of harm's way. It's a very dark joke here about, you know, his violence was actually interrupted. You know, he taught the youth effectively, <laughs> but I, 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 not, to, not to get too morbid, but yeah. Right. But I mean, that, that's the point, though, is that it's like you if you had a situation like that, for, nobody like that could be hired by a police department right? You couldn't be hired by a police department. And if they did somehow hire you, and then something like that happened, it would be an unbelievable political scandal. Like, people's heads would roll. But when it's a nonprofit that you're just funding, uh, you know, there's going to be some articles about, well, the city shouldn't be funding this. But there's never the level of public outrage that would take place if anything like that happened with police officers. So a lot of the time people will talk about, you know, violence interrupter programs like, oh, this is better than the police because, you know, the cops, we can't trust the cops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The violence interrupter programs are far less impacted by public opinion and they are far less uh, responsive and they are far, they are far more opaque in terms of how they operate and they hire people who are oftentimes of very low moral caliber and they'll claim, well, all of these people are, you know, they're reformed criminals. How do you know someone's reformed if you hire them within six months of them getting released from prison? It's one thing if you hire someone 10 years after they got out and they've shown themselves they've never gotten in trouble with the law since. But you hire someone six months, a year after they get out of prison and you just say, oh, this guy's reformed. It's fine. How do you know he's reformed? Because he hasn't committed another felony in the last five months. There's no evidence of reformation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and there's we've we've already said many examples here. I'll, I'll just give a couple more that you know. Since you and I were chatting a few weeks ago, I have found a couple like two weeks ago, a, a San Francisco homeless service provider was stripped of their contract uh, worth six hundred thousand dollars a year. After they were accused of fraud and falsifying records, there was someone in that Detroit. That might be the one I was talking about um, earlier. Yeah, that, there's a Detroit nonprofit accused of stealing forty million dollars. The Detroit Riverfront Conservancy apparently used the group's funds for personal purchases from Louis Vuitton to diamonds. So, like, 
it, it's not the case that this is like one or two big incidents that that we're pulling from over the last 10 years. Like this really does seem to pop up all the time. And so I guess that that leads me into, you know, a, a question about I don't know. I, I do wonder, is this a case where the very idea of this is bad and we should just be minimizing this as much as possible? Or is this simply that the implementation is bad? It, is it a case where legitimately some of these things should be outsourced um, and we just need stricter controls? Or like, how do you think about this? Uh, my answer would be would be no. I think it's a systemic problem. I think that the entire system just... just uh, I, I legitimately think that the entire system just fundamentally doesn't function. Because the problem is when you use... When you use nonprofits instead of government serve instead of actual government agencies, uh, you can ha- wind up having you know dozens of nonprofits that you ha- you are funding, right? Nobody is ever, especially because a lot of these nonprofits use volunteers. So a lot of the time they aren't even having you know some of the people doing this stuff aren't even employees; they're volunteers with the organization. So when you have a, an enormous number of nonprofits that you're funding, uh the fe- the issue of you not having sufficient oversight of their hiring practices, for example, being the most obvious issue, that's a problem that is never going to be able to be fixed because there is no way that every single solitary nonprofit that you are giving money to, there's no way that you're going to go into all of them and say, we're going to, and, and say, we need to look into the background of every one of your volunteers every one of your employees it's just not going to happen it's too complicated when you have 40 50 60 nonprofits that you're funding more than that in most cities i mean san francisco probably funds hundreds and it's simply too complicated to go into all of them and try to figure out well who, who is actually running these things um and so it's just not feasible Whereas if you have a government agency doing something well everyone who comes in the door before they get hired is going to be background checked that's a lot more, uh, that's a lot easier to do than it is to try and exercise sufficient oversight over dozens or hundreds of different nonprofit organizations, some of which are quite small. I mean, they'll fund nonprofits that, you know, only have three, four employees. And so this, this distribution of all these funds across such a large number of organizations, uh, many of which have volunteers that just come and go, you're never going to be able to make sure that everyone involved in these organizations is someone who should be having access to government money. It's just not going to happen. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you a, a clarifying question here, just because I, I want to really get at like, w- like down to like the ground level of this. Certainly the government should not do literally everything. Like just to, to use a ridiculous example, the government doesn't need to manufacture its own computers or, or build its own operating right. system. Like it can buy an right. Asus Zen book. It can use Windows. Like there are some things, and that's a competitive market. That's not a nonprofit thing. But there are some instances where we're like, yeah, the government should just buy from a contractor, whether it's a private market contractor or if there were if there were nonprofit laptops, it would be fine for the government to just buy nonprofit laptops. Right. But like in some instances, the government should just do something, and legitimately, private businesses or other organizations will be more efficient than the government. And is that just because it, in most of these instances, well, this is a big private company that does a lot of business everywhere, so we can trust their efficiency? Or, or is it something about private versus nonprofit? Or like, is it is it something to do with the function of what we're doing? Like, where is the line of like what the government should be in the business of doing and what they should not? Well, I mean, the example you gave of them what just like buying things, you know, b- operating systems, computers, what have you. I mean, in those instances, they're they're just buying from a from a company that is that has a large number of different funding sources. They aren't one hundred percent funded by the government, and they don't just exist to do government programs, right? I think there's a fundamental difference between um, an organization that is that exists for other reasons, like a computer company exists, whether or not the government is going to be giving them money. Uh, the difference between that and the nonprofits is the nonprofits are actually u- being used to run programs that are just government programs. And the government is the only buyer of those programs. 
it isn't it, they aren't buying from any kind of like uh, organization that has any other means of funding itself. The government is just solely responsible for providing all the money for this, basically, uh, because they're the ones who fund. There's no competitive marketplace for homeless services. What you're saying, right? There's no com- there's no competitive marketplace. It's a natural monopoly, right? Uh, uh, you know, homeless services are basically, um, basically are either a, either it's a government monopoly where the government is providing almost all the homeless services, or it's a government monopsony where the government is paying other organizations to run all the homeless services. Either way, all, almost all the money is coming from the state. So there's no such thing as privatized. There's, I mean, there's really no such thing as privatized uh, homeless services. I mean, yes, people, they might get money from donations, but if you're looking at the amount of money spent on homelessness, it, 90% of it's coming from the state. So there's no such thing as, as privatized homelessness services. It's all going to hit, be funded by the government no matter what. The only question is whether or not the government is running it from kind of a, a centralized organization that can take advantage of you know economies of scale, that can make sure everyone involved is getting background checked, or whether the government is, run, is just funding it through 50 different nonprofit organizations, none of which have any real oversight, uh, which have, you know, different philosophies and different ideas of even how to handle homelessness. So, you know, there's no central, there's no like actual plan here, right? Because every nonprofit has its own plan about how to handle the issue and we just give them money. So that's, I mean, that's a fundamentally different situation than the government just buying computers because computers, the government is not the sole purchaser. The one thing I will say, the one thing I will say, and I I think you're broadly correct here, there are some instances where the government buys products like computers or hammers or, you know, sprockets, widgets, whatever, where they are the sole purchaser. Like you think in the military, this happens a lot, but, you know, that uh, military procurement is also famously not a very organized or well-run system. So I don't, I think that in the end also supports your point. Um, And I, I don't know, I'm, Something I think about a lot when I think about this is the, you know, Harry Truman, one of the American ideals of of government and, and of responsibility is, you know, that famous sign he kept on his desk, the buck stops here, that I am responsible, right. I, I take responsibility for what happens. And this seems to me to be kind of the opposite of that, like, the, you know, the city doesn't actually want to take responsibility. They don't want to be held responsible if the thing fails. So there's a layer of like plausible deniability. And and what's interesting, and I, I think this is something you've touched on before, is that the, the political coalitions here are very interesting because you and I are closer to, I don't know even what you'd want to call it, but like the technocratic center or the center left or, you know, however you would describe your own politics. Whereas the cities that we're talking about are typically more towards the the very far left or the progressive left or you know many people in these cities would proudly call themselves socialist again whichever label you want to use that's the idea and yet right. the cities that are the most progressive or with the most socialists are the ones that have the government outsourcing the most stuff which sounds like a very like neoliberal idea yeah. and so you know they're actually in a weird way progressives are decaying the power of, of the state, which is not it, like there's just an odd political dynamic here, right? Right. Well, I, I you know I've said this repeatedly. I mean, this is kind of like an esoteric point that I'm making here that is kind of a little a little orthogonal to what we're overall talking about. But I think a big issue is that um, for all their talk about being socialists, I just don't think the modern progressive movement actually is socialist at all. Because I think the modern progressive movement has been very impacted lately by anarchist ideas, where a lot of the time they don't like the government, even though they are nominally, oh, we're, we're big government socialists, progressives, whatever. That's what, what they say. But at the same time, they have a very um, paranoid, almost hyper-libertarian attitude towards any utilization of state power. They really hate the state in a lot of ways. They hate um, law enforcement, which without law enforcement, you basically can't have any government programs. Uh, so 
their attitude towards the government is is very schizophrenic where on the one hand they claim to want all of this these big socialist programs these big progressive programs but on the other hand they ha- harbor a deeply paranoid suspicion and hatred of the visible manifestations of government power and so it's not surprising then that you have a lot of these very lefty progressive areas where they want to fund all of these government programs, but they then don't ever have the government running those programs. Because that's a natural consequence of a belief system that simultaneously says, oh, we want to spend money on all these things, but then also they hate all of the visible manifestations of state power. And they have this very anarchistic attitude towards the government. Um, And this very DIY attitude where they're like, oh, we should be having mutual aid. We should be having blah, 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 all that stuff, which is utter nonsense because mutual aid is a joke compared to just having the government, you know, give people welfare. But, uh, but so that entire attitude, that, that kind of anarchistic anti-state crypto libertarian attitude that a lot of progressives have that then leads them to support, you know, well, we want all the stuff funded, but we hate the government. So then what are you going to do? Well, you have these lefty nonprofits that are run by your friends and you just give them money to uh, to run a lot of these programs and it doesn't actually work. And in the end, you don't really get homeless people housed. But that kind of is a natural manifestation of a belief system that is ostensibly supportive of a large number of government programs, but also hates the government at the same time. I mean, let me let me drill in on something you you mentioned right there, which is that, you know, oh, a lot of these nonprofits are going to be run by your friends. And that is potentially right. a really important point in that there's a model of wit this where you can look at it and say, okay, this is a bunch of really progressive politicians who want to spend a bunch of money and they want to do it specifically through nonprofits. And those nonprofits also happen to be aligned with them, happen to be staffed by people who are you know, uh, support their election and will help them organize and will build their political base. And you could almost view this as a form of like clientelism, you know, in in, almost in the same way as like, uh, you know, the Tammany Hall kind of graft of just, you know, you know, my friends get everything. My friends get fat government contracts and then they help me get elected again. So my my question for you, clearly this is, is part of it. But do you th- what do you think is a bigger factor? Is it is it genuinely like just an ideological mistake that people are making where they're not intending to be corrupt, but they just, for whatever reason, they have stupid ideas about how to run the government and we've ended up in this stupid place? Or do you think that kind of the cynical, no, I'm actually just cynically giving money to my friends is a bigger explanation here? Oh, it's both. I mean, it depends on the specific situation, but I mean, a lot of the time, a lot of the time, it, this is, the system is enormously corrupt uh, to the point where I personally have told people that I think the most corrupt city in America is Seattle. And I don't even think it's particularly close. Um, Seattle is is freakishly corrupt. And a lot of their corruption is is centered around the nonprofit industrial complex. I don't know if I mentioned this in my American Fa- Affairs piece, but I've, I've written about this elsewhere. Um, and I mentioned this a little earlier, but I mean, there was an organization uh, uh, that they gave a $3 million no-bid contract to that is run by a bunch of convicted felons. And the story there is one of the most wildly corrupt things that I've ever heard of. Where what happened was in 2020, there was an organization called King County Equity Now. They're not the one run by felons. An organization called King County Equity Now that was uh, involved in a lot of the organizing of the George Floyd protests. So the city of Seattle wanted to pay them $3 million to write a report on, uh, on like racial equity, which is insane to begin with. Because that, I mean, that amount of money is ludicrous for someone to do like basically a policy paper on like racial equity ideas. That's an absurd amount of cash. And they didn't want to put this out for a bid. I just want to say, I just want to say that if anybody wants to pay six or seven figures for a white paper, just please give me a call. Right. I, I am ready and willing. <laughs> yeah. God, just you know, just contact me anyhow. So right. continue. <laughs> but they, uh, so they they wanted to give millions of dollars, to the, but they wanted to go to this one organization 
which just so happened to be involved in organizing a lot of the George Floyd protests. So it was very politically powerful at the time. So they didn't want to put this out for a bid. They wanted to give millions of dollars to this one organization um, in a no-bid contract. Now, the problem they ran into was that there's actually a law saying they couldn't do that because what happened was King County Equity Now was a coalition of a group of different uh, nonprofits, okay? But they hadn't registered as a nonprofit themselves yet. They, I, I believe that they filed their paperwork, but it hadn't cleared. And there's a law, I don't know if it's a state law or just in Seattle, that you can't give more than like a certain amount of money. It's like $90,000 or something like that. You can't give a no-bid contract to someone who is not a like registered nonprofit. I don't know if it's just nonprofits. Maybe it's also like like a maybe you'd be allowed to do this with like a corporate entity too. But if they're not like a registered nonprofit, you can't give that much money to them in a no bid procedure. You have to put it out for a bid. But they didn't want to put it out for a bid because they wanted the money to go to King County Equity Now. So what they did was they used something called a fiscal sponsor. Where a fiscal sponsor is is you find a different nonprofit to handle the money and they basically then um, are basically the financial babysitter where they handle the money, but then King County Equity Now does the work and still receives the money kind of secondhand where the one person is responsible for actually hand handling the funds because you're allowed to give them the money and then King County Equity Now just gets paid for their work basically. It's, it's how you do it. This is like subcontracting basically. It, essentially it's subcontracting, where but they call it a fiscal sponsor. So the organization they find to be the fiscal sponsor is a group called King K uh, called uh, Freedom Project. Now, Freedom Project, um, something goes wrong where somehow Freedom Project cuts out King County Equity Now and winds up running the program entirely. So they tried to give this $3 million no-bid contract to King County Equity Now, somehow screw everything up, and all the money winds up in the hands of Freedom Project, and they're running the project now. Uh, so they basically received this $3 million no-bid contract. Now, Freedom Project, if you go and you look at the cr criminal history of the Board of Governors of Freedom Project, uh, one of the guys who I believe is president now of the organization, um, when he was 16, he took part in the gang rape of a pregnant 17-year-old um, and spent like 25 years in prison. You have to do something really messed up to get like a 25-year prison sentence as a 16-year-old. So he gets out and is hired not that long after um, by Freedom Project and kind of rises up the ranks and was, was on their board of governors and I believe is the president now. There's another guy who was on the board of governors who committed a drive-by shooting. He shot a 16-year-old and almost killed him. The kid lost part of his lung. Another guy on the board of governors um, was a drug dealer who uh, shot up a snitch at his house to try to intimidate him into not talking to the police. Well, the guy's uh, girlfriend and her kids were in the driveway. Um, there was a woman who worked at, who was there in kind of an executive position, um, who kicked her daughter to death. Her like five-year-old daughter, she kicked her to death. And this organization gets $3 million in a no-bid contract from the city of Seattle which is then um, completely mismanaged, un unsurprisingly. Like, the person who was running the, uh, the actual, who was supposed to, like, be the head researcher on this project, claimed to be a volunteer and was then paid, like, a hundred-something dollars an hour. There, was, there were organizations getting hundreds of thousands of dollars for no discernible work. They'd, they'd contribute, like, five, six pages to this report and get paid, like, a hundred grand. And so you give that, like, you, they wound up because they were trying to basically give $3 million to just a politically connected organization in one of the most blatantly corrupt acts that I might, I might have seen in, you know, municipal government in a long time. They want to give millions of dollars to this specific organization they can't give it to. They try to use a different organization as a fiscal sponsor. That organization is run by, oh, run by a bunch of convicted felons, including one guy who they hired practically right out of prison who then uh, went on to commit another murder like eight months after they hired him. So this entire organization is run by a bunch of convicted felons, many of which got out of prison right before being hired by Freedom Project. And they wind up with access to $3 million of taxpayer money 
for um, basically just a policy paper, which is an insane amount of money for any policy paper. And it winds up just being this absolute mess where they illegally hide. Uh, I mean, there was a a, uh, a report on this from the government where they basically hired a bunch of subcontractors without running it by the city council, which they were not allowed to do and gave all these groups like hundreds of thousands of dollars. The good news is the, the good news is that at least after that policy paper was released, racism in the city of Seattle was solved. And so, you know, now it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> but I, I'm making a joke, but I, th I think that is the, the, the other side of this coin. Like it's very lurid and it's very like fun in, in, in a weird abstract sense, fun, I guess, to talk about these like crazy examples. And it's so ridiculous. They, they hired a guy who ended up murdering someone while he was on their payroll and they hired this crazy felon. And here, here's an instance of like outright theft. But I, I think it's also important to note that even in the instances where they're not, you know, this nonprofit is not literally run by felons, this nonprofit is not literally stealing right. the money, that this just doesn't seem to be a very effective way of doing things. Even the the so-called good nonprofits here, you know, a, a lot of these problems are getting worse and not better. And, and these are things we should want right. as, you know, nobody wants more homeless people on the street. We need to do something about the homeless problem. We need to build more housing. We do need a, a better system of policing in this country. The system of policing is certainly not perfect, but the, you know, beyond the actual corruption, there's just the ineffectiveness right. of, you know, of even the good ones. That's yeah. I mean, that's completely correct. And I mean, I try to, I try to, I try to make that point on, on both of those issues. Cause I think it's important to talk about, I mean, I think in order to get people interested in this, you kind of have to talk about the the more lurid tabloid elements, uh, because that's the stuff that, you know, kind of grabs someone's attention, right? So I think that you kind of have to discuss both simultaneously because the the corrupt elements, the tabloid elements, the they gave hundred thousand dollars to a convicted, you know, sex offender or whatever. That stuff is, you know, very, very those are big issues where that shouldn't be happening. Uh but it's also something that is just interesting to people and that kind of grabs their attention. But you are correct that even absent those more lurid uh, tabloid type stories, um, the system just simply doesn't function because, um, I mean, and it, it is because of a lot of the same problems is that there's just a generalized lack of oversight. And that generalized lack of oversight is why criminals are able to gain access to millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, whatever. But it also means that even when people's heart is in the right place, even when they really want to help people, there's not some overarching plan for how to solve any of these problems because every nonprofit is going to have its own ideas and its own philosophy and its own, you know, conception of how the problem should be dealt with. And a lot of the time, those ideas they have don't work because, uh, I mean, there's not enough, you know, evidentiary basis for what they think they should be doing. Sometimes the stuff that these different nonprofits are doing are at cross purposes with one another, or they duplicate one another's efforts. And so they just waste a bunch of money trying to do the same thing. And so a big part of it is, is that the generalized lack of oversight that's inherent to this system enables both the kind of very, uh, very enter kind of darkly entertaining stories of theft and corruption but it also means that even in the event that everyone is doing what they're supposed to do you're still not going to get positive outcomes because a lot of these organizations they just aren't uh you know they aren't they don't have uh, you know they aren't knowledgeable enough they aren't professional enough um there's no overarching plan for how to solve any problem it's just every organization just goes and does something and that's not when you have you know i mean in in the city of san francisco and this is true in san francisco approximately six percent of all african americans are homeless um that's an insane statistic but it's also true i've i mean you can figure you can you know figure this out just by looking at how many homeless people there are what percentage are black and then comparing that to the black population of san francisco and about 6% of all African Americans in San Francisco are homeless. You need 
a serious plan to deal with a with a, a problem of that enormity. You know, you need to have, you know, a, to really buckle down and figure out how to deal with this. And that simply is not going to happen if your entire plan is we're just going to give 50 nonprofits a bunch of money and they can just go do their thing. Yeah. And, and I mean, the look, it, it's not that San Francisco is not willing to spend the money because God knows they spend an enormous amount of money on homeless services. It, it, they spend so like much money. Dollars a year. They spend so much money on homeless services that it's almost like it would make more sense to just take all that money and cut a check to every homeless person, and that would probably solve the problem better than what they're doing right now. It, not that that's like my my ideal of the only thing you should idea. be doing, <laughs> but like it, it genuinely, like the money would be better spent as just given to people. Um, but. But we're coming up on time, so unfortunately, because this is okay. a really fascinating conversation, I want to end with the traditional question that I always end the podcast with, and that is, where can people go to learn more if they're interested in what we're talking about here? And I will start by recommending, again, we're going to link uh, the, some of the articles that, uh, that John has written, um, but other than your own article, if people are interested in learning more about what we're talking about here... What would you recommend for them? This could be other podcasts to listen to, books, articles, papers to read. If people want to learn more, what should they do? Well, I mean, a lot of uh, there's a lot of good articles that I mean, for me, a lot of the stuff that I I found on this, um, I, I think that there's a uh, website called the San Francisco Standard that does a lot of reporting on specifically San Francisco's uh, situation with these nonprofit organizations and kind of the corruption there. I mean, local local media in general, I think, will have a lot of stories on this stuff. The problem that I find is that with a lot of them, it'll they will just look at individual stories of the nonprofit corruption or whatever and will not really, a lot of the time, they don't really link the stuff together into a broader point about the system being broken. It's just, oh, look at this one nonprofit that stole stuff. But I mean, it really there's no one place to go i mean i think that local media in a lot of these places will report on a lot of this stuff um the san francisco standard like i said does uh i i can't think of one specific place that you would go to learn about it um because really it's just like it well i mean my entire point of here is that this problem is is that everything is too uh diffuse and not centralized enough well that results in the same problem which is any article you're going to find on this is just going to be you know it's just going to be some random article in a newspaper somewhere there's not a lot of there's not a lot of really centralized discussion of this or you know publications that really dig deeply into this because it, it is such a diffuse and broadly distributed problem so, I mean, I would just say read local media, I guess. The San Francisco Standard has a lot of articles on this stuff. Um, the Chronicle will report on it. The uh, Seattle Times will report on it sometimes. Um, regarding the uh, the $3 million no-bid contract I was talking about, there's a website called Seattle City Council Insight. And if you want to learn more about that story I was referencing about the $3 million no-bid contract where... Uh, all the money got mismanaged by uh, Freedom Project. Uh, you can just Google um, like Black Brilliance Project was what it was called. Seattle City Council Insight, and they had a four part uh, they had a four part piece kind of tracking the money and talking about that that I thought was very good. Um, so that that's probably where I would start. Well, this is going to take a long time to unwind because it does seem to be pretty deeply embedded in a, within a lot of our cities. Um, but I want to thank my guest, Jonathan Ireland, for coming on the show today. This has been really fascinating to talk about. John, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.